Once again, my name is Jake Ware, and good afternoon, and thanks for being with us again for the second leadership development session brought to you by the ASTA Lead Committee. We're calling the future of work. There's no question that the landscape of work has been hugely impacted by the pandemic. We've all had to quickly adapt to new ways of getting work done, and many companies transition to a fully remote format. Now that restrictions are being lifted, what does this new office space look like, and how do we as leaders adapt to it? It's no doubt a timely topic, and not one that's easily solved. So we've convened a panel of senior industry professionals to go over some of the current literature on the subject and discuss their personal experiences and struggles. So our panelists include Andrew Lauer, a sales representative at Syngenta, Dan Four, CEO of Lacrosse Seed and an ASTA Regional Vice President, uh, Mike Guna, Global CEO of Rice Tech, and with us virtually is John Chisholm, Customer Service and Sales Support Leader at Corteva AgriScience. During these presentations, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box under the screen, not the chat box at the right. For in-person attendees, fill out the question card at your table, and Katie, raise your hand, Katie. Katie will be relaying all questions to me up here, and we'll try to uh, address as many of these as possible at the end of the session. So, um, so let's get right to it and begin with a summary of a few articles on the subject. I think this is, there we go. Okay, so the first article we want to look at, I believe it went too far. So the first article that, uh, that we all looked at is called What Employees Are Saying About the Future of Remote Work. So this was put on by McKenzie and company. And what's interesting here is they were looking at these things beforehand, right? So they were surveying people beforehand, and they really um, looked at their survey re results prior and after the pandemic. Another thing that they dive into is um, the... Uh, the level of anxiety and how people are feeling really about this transition and about these changes and how that can directly affect our productivity um, at the company. So first, let's dive into a few stats. Um, so pre-COVID, we're at about 25% of people that wanted a flexible um, remote slash in-office um, uh, work schedule. Post-pandemic, we're looking at 52%. So literally doubled the amount of people. When we break that down um, and we try to understand how serious these people are about it uh, and, you know, are, how are you likely to leave your job if you're not offered a flexible remote schedule? Globally, we had 30 percent um, that say that they're either likely or very likely. And within the United States, it's 28 percent. So um, they're not only saying, yes, I would like this. Uh, a, a, a good portion of them are saying that I'm willing to leave my job if I don't have this available to me. And then if we break down, okay, so what do you mean by remote work? Uh, and really when they look at it, more or less, um, it, it means three plus days uh, a week that you're allowed to work from home. And then that number increases if um, the employee has um, young or or um, older children that are in the house. Oh, I'll go back. So I want to stop here. Uh, and uh, and John, are you with us? Yes, I am. Oh, there you are. Um, I wanted to start with you. Uh, when you uh, look at these stats, and uh, is that something you're seeing? Um, is it uh, is it uh, is it relevant in, in, into your world? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, uh, of course, at Agri Science, we have done a couple different surveys of our employee base globally. Um, we'll survey the employees to, to get their thoughts and also our, our people managers. And uh, I would say you know, what, what, what we see in Cortana, both in the U.S. and globally, is, is, is really quite consistent with the statistics that you just uh, summarized, Jake. Okay, okay. Um, Mike at Rice Tech. Um, what are you seeing something similar? Are you getting similar feedback? So I think it's important to remember that in our industry, particularly in our company, that 80% of the people don't have these choices, mm. right? Most of our people are on the front lines, they're touching the seed, they're 
planting plots, measuring plots, hand seed, loading trucks, filling bags, all that sort of stuff, and it requires that they be on site. Mm -hmm. So even through the whole pandemic, I think probably most of us can say that most of our workforce was there full time. So what we're really talking about is a relatively small percentage of the population, maybe 20%. Mm -hmm. This is HR people, finance people, uh, IT people, and maybe some administrative type people that have the luxury to even think about this. Now within that group, I think there are some people that strongly desire to have a flexible work arrangement and there are others that absolutely want to get back to the office space mm. and there's reasons on both sides of that some of it could be the children's situation that you talked about some of it could be their work situation at home that's maybe not conducive to productivity and the thing that i think people are missing is what i call the collaboration factor you know it's one thing to be uh active and doing your job but you miss those moments where you can in a sort of an ad hoc way, talk to other people, share ideas, get support or give support, and I think that's what people feel like they're missing. So it really gets down to personal choices. Mm. Yeah, very good. Um, one thing that they uh, dug into in this study was um, the, 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 the increase in anxiety. So the, the people that they studied, and I think it's arguable, um, you know, McKenzie said that they saw a productivity spike when people went home um, um, during the pandemic to work. And I would push back against that a little bit. And, and really to your point, Mike, that depending on the type of work, um, they may have saw an increase in, in productivity. But one thing McKinsey gets to is that they saw an increase in productivity in these types of jobs, but they also saw at the same time an increase in anxiety among those employees in regards to the um, um, this exact question of, of work flexibility. And they state that every time that they've seen anxiety like this within employees increase, it's followed by a productivity decrease. And uh, so it's really something that's interesting to think about and, uh, and, and, and in interesting to watch and pay attention to. Um, so Andrew, I want to go to you. So you're um, newer in, into your career. Um, and uh, uh, what are your what are your thoughts on this, and what um, is it something that within your peers, and, and is it something that's talked about? Is it something that 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 you see as um, being really quite relevant? And do you relate to the stats that we're looking at as well? Absolutely. So currently, we're going through a transformation, and I think um, what I found uh, connected most with me was. Um, the, the centering around the anxiety within you know the uh, the business perhaps because conversations aren't happening that need to be happening between a manager and an employee um, and we're in a space right now where you you know asking the question how are you doing not how are you doing against meeting your sales goals not how are you doing with your research research portfolio but how are you doing at home? How's your family doing? Do you have what you need? Do you need a second computer monitor at home? Do you feel you're more productive at home? Okay, you're not meeting your goals. Why aren't you productive? Mm -hmm. So there are these open-ended questions that perhaps before may not have been asked because there were assumptions and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I think back to um, a period over the last nine months where I worked on a project with three others um, and for three out of the four of us, there were children in the background of the Zoom crying or, you know, something needed to, to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and there are different stresses, you know, now more than ever before. And I thought it was interesting that um, employees with young children are more likely to prefer remote work. Yes, if you have daycare. Mm -hmm. that, that was my thought. You know, when yeah. I read that, I thought, well, I don't know if we want to be at home all day together as a family <laughs> trying to achieve the business goals. Yeah. But, um, uh, but it's been better for the family environment. We had a baby right before uh, the pandemic. But there's been a lot of communication, you know, with my manager and, and other mm -hmm. uh, colleagues um, to ensure that we're aligning even, for example, a team conference call at a time that works for everyone. Sure, sure. Interesting. Um, 
so a personal note on my side, I, uh, um, in 2017, so I was based in California. In 2017, I took a remote job um, um, where I'm managing a team throughout the U.S. and Canada, and everybody's remote on the team. And, you know, for, for that role, I just need to be by an airport, basically, to be able to manage this team. And part of the, the reason for that move was to, to bring us back home. Um, we had very young children. We were just having our third baby. And, um, and, but my wife's a stay-at-home mom, and it really helps then. And um, with my remote role, when we were looking for a house, we specifically were looking for where am I going to work? Because, and I was just talking to a gentleman out in the hallway about this, I think that's one of, one of the most important aspects if you're working remotely to do it successfully, is to be able to have a place to go and to wholly be in your work. And then be able to, whether it's a real door or not, but be able to close the door on that and then be with your family and, and not as much mix through. You know, with the pandemic, I think a lot of people were just thrown into their house, which they didn't really have a design or a plan, and all of a sudden daycare, you don't have daycare anymore, and you just kind of have to push through and figure that out. Um, but when I really think about can remote work be done well, I think the answer is yes, but it has to be done well. Um, okay, very good. Um, Dan, so <laughs> how are you? I'm good. Good. Um, so Running a company like Lacrosse Seed, which um, is uh, you know relatively smaller than you know the Syngentas and Cortevas and Just and, a uh, and Rice Tech, a bit. yeah, um, you know I, it's uh, it's definitely a different environment. So you know what can are you seeing kind of the same thing with these stats, or is it a conversation within the office? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, so we're we're roughly um, call it 80 employees, um, very similar to what Mike said as far as the percent of staff that's sort of out in the field or has to be you know in the office or doing production work or what have you, and then about 20 percent of the folks um, are office based. Mm -hmm. And I guess um, what we saw, and I, I'll never forget March 13th. I mean that was when the world flipped upside down, and my controller and I were you know scrambling over the electronic stores in La Crosse trying to find laptops so that we could send them home with our customer service team. And I would say, if you measure like my anxiety on a, on a scale, that was the highest level of, of anxiety yeah. I've personally felt um, in, in my years in business. And a lot of that was just dealing with the unknown, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what rules were gonna come about, how bad was this pandemic that we were dealing with. And I would say that the staff was ex extremely anxious at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the folks that got to work at home, you could say that the people that had to come to the office or to their production sites were, were somewhat jealous of that because they said that that's mm -hmm. not fair, right? Mm -hmm. That I'm going to be exposed or potentially exposed and, and knock on wood, uh, we, we passed through the pandemic with, with very little incidents. Good. But um, as it relates to the numbers of, of people uh, willing to leave the company or take you know, dramatic job changes, I would say and part of this I attribute to our culture, but I, I think we're fairly well protected mm -hmm. uh, from that. Um, we have always been a very flexible company that tries to accommodate the needs of, of our people. And what, what we saw was actually a desire for folks to come back um, because they miss that sense of community. Mm -hmm. I think in, in smaller organizations, uh, you, you, you lean on each other a lot more and mm -hmm. it's not as uh, siloed as maybe some of the larger organizations are, not to say that that's bad or good. But um, no, we, we're presently, uh, we, we brought everybody back the first week of June um, mm -hmm. that could come back. We've got a couple employees that still do a hybrid approach. So I guess my, my takeaway from uh, at least this first article was, you know, as a, as a leader or a business manager, understanding that the needs of your people and, and potentially using hybrid approaches is, is what needs to be done. Okay, very good. Absolutely, please. So, um, you know, the, they talk about this stress, and I think it's, it's reasonable, their stress. I mean, one of the things that sort of switched in my mind was um, people say, oh, are you working from home? And I'd say, yeah, I'm working from home, but I've switched my vernacular to living at work. <laughs> you know, you find yourself working many more hours yeah. in front of that computer than perhaps you would have been when you were able to turn it on and off with your commute, right? Yeah. And I think that's part of what's adding to the stress. And the other part that seems to be from the feedback that I've heard from people is the out of sight, out of mind quotient. And mm -hmm. I think this has been documented in several studies that people that are working from home are much less likely to be promoted mm -hmm. 
because you don't see them, you don't touch them, you don't share ideas with them, you don't have the concept of how they are with the team because it's sort of invisible. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I actually got from one of my employees is I really want to stay at home, but I don't want to be the first one laid off. Yeah. And so those things added together, sort of that uh, ambiguity about what's my relationship with the company, combined with the stress of additional work because it's always there in front of you, I think yeah. adds to that stress factor. Yeah, we had, we had something similar um, before the pandemic. We did a, a survey, as you do sometimes, of our um, employees. And uh, um, specifically with our, our sales and product development teams, which are by nature uh, remote-based, um, there was that sentiment directly that, you know, I, I feel like I don't have as much um, opportunity for, for two reasons, for the out of sight, out of mind, but also because as a company, a lot of the promotions that they would move into are um, based in the corporate office. And so, and you know, not everybody wants to move to Davis, California, um, or France, or whatever it may be. And then, um, <laughs> so we'll put you in for the next one. Um, in, 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 in speak, France, okay. Um, in speaking to that, uh, specifically, um, it was a different article I was reading on the same subject, but um, one of the things that they talked about in regards to doing this well, and coming from a multinational company, I, 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 I live and breathe this, and it's being respectful of time zones. And you really have to think about that. Where is this person based that I'm setting this meeting? You know, it's uh, all of a sudden you see a meeting pop up at 4 a.m. on your thing. You're like, okay, you know, do I really need to do this or what is it? But it, it's really something that if you haven't done it before, you really need to be conscious of that because if you're all of a sudden asking somebody to, you know, do a meeting at, you know, 7 p.m., 8, 7.30, 8, you know, what, you know, it, it's where do you draw the line because there's not a, everybody's leaving the office at this point in time um, uh, sentiment there. So, uh, John, anything to add there? We just see stats. We don't see your face. I, I have no body language from you. No, great, great discussion, you know, and uh, as, as has been mentioned throughout, uh, very dynamic space. We've all been evolving and, uh, you know, I think it's going to be just really important to continue to have an open mind and to continually evaluate the situation, you know, as we go through the rest of this year and, and, and into future years. Uh, we're all um, kind of working from new paradigms. And I know at least uh, at my company at Corteva, we, we are planning to be very intentional with periodic reevaluations, depending on the function, depending on the group, how's it going, what, what might we want to consider tweaking, uh, because we are all, are all learning together. Okay, very good. Okay, so this, this was written by Vanessa Furmans um, with the uh, Wall Street Journal. And the article is called, uh, Bosses Still Aren't Sure Remote Workers Have Hustle. So um, a, uh, a, it's, 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 I think it's a, a really interesting conversation, um, this exact point, because it's something that um, maybe we're not all willing to talk about, but it's something that, that I think is, uh, it's, it's, it's really healthy to do so, and it's, it's almost looming um, on the topic. Um, so a few uh, prominent CEOs um, that have made comments on this, uh, so J.P. Morgan Chase, remote work doesn't, doesn't work well for those who want to hustle. Goldman Sachs, um, um, CEO has called it an aberration of what, that we are going to correct as soon as possible. And then WeWork CEO, which I, I wasn't really familiar with WeWork, but when I looked it up, obviously uh, uh, Sandeep Pier has a, uh, an iron in the fire because WeWork is office space. Um, so it said employees who are uberly engaged with their companies would want to go to the office at least two-thirds of the time. Um, so, Mike, I wanted to go to you first on this one. And, uh, um, you know, is it, is it something that... Um, you see that, I mean, not even just within the, the, the C-suite leadership, but just managers in general, do you think that managers that have, and we will be fo we'll focused on the, the, the traditional uh, corporate office jobs, um, do we see that there's this um, sentiment? Um, yeah. Well, so, you know, I started my career in production plants, and so every day you knew what you did. How many acres did you plant? How many bags did you put out? How many trucks did you ship? How many acres did you harvest? Da, 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 da. It was very easy, and then I moved into more of an administrative role, and suddenly I had a whole room full of cubes and offices and people apparently doing things in those offices, but you couldn't really tell. 
In fact, it was always sort of a negative feedback loop. You know, you knew that something wasn't going right and people weren't going productive when that transaction didn't happen or this document wasn't set up or this shipment didn't take place or whatever. And so it was very, very difficult whether they're sitting right in front of you or sitting at home to know if administrative people are productive. And so you have to find other ways to sort of measure that by putting out project timelines and sort of checking the milestones along the way, but also understanding how they work as a team, which is dramatically challenging in this dispersed environment. Now, they're starting to put together different kinds of softwares, oddly enough, Slack being one of them, where when you come on to work that day, you open up a chat room, and instead of popping your head in an office, you pop up a chat and say, hey, what do you think about this? One of the struggles that we're having today, at least us as managers and leaders, is we feel like we really have to make an appointment with our people now to talk to them, yep. as opposed to sticking yep. your head in the office. And if they're not obviously on the phone, you know, just saying, hey, you know, what do you think about this or what do you think about that or can you help, come help me with this thing? You don't feel, we don't feel comfortable in our culture doing that. So mm -hmm. that sort of dialogue interaction that you would normally expect to have mm -hmm. is really ultimately more difficult. And back, again, back to that uh, you know, kind of collaboration factor that I talked about earlier, I think is, is a challenge to kind of keep going if you have people in this dispersed, sort of unconnected environment. So I think that's, that's the main thing to get past with all of this. Yeah, yeah, and personally I found it, uh, um, I have, m there's a lot fewer times that somebody just gives me a call, and a lot more times that they schedule a half hour meeting. And so it just, you know, oh, Jake's got a half hour here, and we can schedule that right in there. And uh, sometimes that's been really convenient to be able to do so. Um, Dan, um, it, it, do you find, you'd mentioned some people working um, remotely or hybrid, and, and you, were, you were promoting the, the hybrid model. Uh, do you find that, um, as you, and I know you're just getting started here in, in doing it um, and, and working through that, but... You know, do you think there's a sentiment of, um, you know, that the person that's remote is, is uh, um, um, you know, doesn't have the advantages that the people that are working there physically do, or even within a meeting, do you think that they get less out of it um, versus the people that are physically there? Yeah, and I think Mike mentioned a little bit ago, you know, one of the downsides of remote workers is that exposure mm -hmm. right, and networking. And I worked for 12 years um, in, with Monsanto, five of which was in St. Louis, so mm -hmm. I kind of get the, you know, corporate landscape uh, mm -hmm. with the buildings and the cubes and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I guess it, in terms of hustle, I think, and, and really performance, mm -hmm. as we talk about performance management, you made a great point that some people might need help learning how to work remotely. Mm -hmm. And what, what I've seen um, that I've been very pleased with is that, you know, we have, we have pods, right? Mm -hmm. And really when we talk about it's customer service that I would say is our most hybrid uh, team right now. There's mm -hmm. eight of them. Uh, maybe two or three are out at some point during the week, uh, largely due to child care. But what we saw early on, and I think the, the team sort of self-corrected, and which is great when you have that accountability within your team. But if you have a customer service team that is partially inside the office and partially outside, when a phone call comes in and it's ringing to all of their phones mm -hmm. on Teams, mm -hmm. the, the folks in the office, obviously, you know, somebody, everybody's looking at each other like, you gonna get it or you, am I gonna get it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But the folks are, that are at home may have the luxury of saying, oh geez, I'm, oh, I, I was just gonna go get a cup of coffee, so I'll go do that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what was really nice that we learned was that, you know, there, there's this balance of, um, helping the folks that are at home say, hey, we're really busy right now. Mm -hmm. Can you guys help uh, grab, grab the phones and, and mm -hmm. make things happen? Because we also know we're in a very seasonal business, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, COVID last year happened at the exact worst time that it mm -hmm. could have ever happened for the seed <laughs> business uh, mm -hmm. because we're scrambling, you know, you scramble anyway to make things happen and then throw that on top of it. Right. But, um, no, I, I think that there's, uh, there's obviously – uh, of an approach to make this work well mm -hmm. and um, when you look at your team members and especially star performers that for whatever reason may need a hybrid approach you just mm -hmm. you need to figure it out yeah yep. Andrew you work remotely right now correct I do you do do you think uh, what if we flip it around um, is there a sentiment that uh, that those uh, within the office place may have advantages that, that you don't have well 
in reading this, especially um, from the infamous millennial perspective, you know, I was reading this and I'm thinking, oh, okay, you're you're really challenging me, you know, mm -hmm. just in the idea that um, we don't have hustle, you know, because um, uh, we're we're lazy or you know what have you as a generation. And I think back to a time, and I had a mentor, Terry Gardner was mm -hmm. his name, and he told me about early in his career he was expected to be in the office on Saturday morning mm -hmm. because if he wasn't there, um, he was viewed as not hustling, you know, and not being a part of it. Yeah. And I think about that and, um, you know, from a millennial uh, perspective, the hustle comes when, you know, you're on your way to the gym or you're on your way to pick up your kids or something and, you know, taking a phone call safely or something like that, right? That it's a part of, it's a part of your life um, that you, you're hustling you're, from, the, from the business perspective. So I think there have been some changes. What I will say is a challenge right now. So I live in, a, we live in a community that's 368 people in rural Western Iowa and hopefully have 30 years left, you know, to work at least. How do you plan a career to achieve, you know, the things that you want to achieve as a family and, and as a professional, um, primarily remote, mm -hmm. you know, without relocating to, you know, Chicago, for example, to, yeah. you know, have those opportunities. So I think that's, that's what I really think about is um, the challenge, you know, to those that are remote. I think when you're in the office, as Mike said, um, you're perceived to have opportunities before others because you're asked first, because you're available to go, you know, have uh, dinner after work with a high-level colleague, for example. Yeah. And so when you're not able to do that, are you truly sacrificing? Um, I, I try not to believe that you are, but perhaps there are some situations where you might be. Yeah, yeah, good point. And, you know, while you're saying that, um, it, it really made me think about um, and if you're at the beginning of a new role, um, being remote. So I hired, I, I hired a, a Canadian-based uh, sales rep uh, last fall. Um, I've never physically met her. The country of Canada won't let me. <laughs> it, uh, um, I've tried, uh, but uh, it's, uh, uh, so we had to bring somebody on. Luckily, she was experienced in the role that she was doing, so that, that helped tremendously. Um, but you think about um, a, a traditional office-based job, and uh, that hypothetically could be done remotely. But somebody new coming into that, and you think about the onboarding and the training aspect of things, and those are challenging to begin with. And you think about those challenges when you can't physically be there to help walk them through things mm -hmm. and, and to do that um, is, is definitely another hurdle to this whole thing. So in anticipation of this sort of moment that mm -hmm. we're into right now where things are starting to open up, we opened our office on June 10th. We put together sort of a decision aid that said, can this job be done remotely or can it, does it have to be on site? And in that, there's really four key elements. Number one is what is the position? Mm -hmm. You know, does it need to touch product or not? Does it need to interface with customers or not? Um, and, you know, at the ground level, uh, number one. Number two is the person. Okay, so is this person competent, well-trained, self-motivated, understand their role, have a network already in a support system, allows them to work more independently? And then number three is the infrastructure. Do they have an office space at home? Do they have the bandwidth to do it? Do they have the equipment and such? And then the last piece is sort of the coaching, mentoring, measurement process that the manager goes through to allow that person to be successful. And all of those things have to come together. And by having a bit of a decision aid, then it's not so arbitrary to say, yeah, you can work at home, but I'm sorry, you have to come in. Yeah. You know, and that's really given our managers the tools and the freedom to work through this with each mm -hmm. one of our people that have been working remotely that we either will or will not have them come back into the office or work in some sort of a hybrid situation. Yeah, and that, that's, I think that's a great point and a good idea to, to really get away from the, uh, the feeling of fairness or unfairness and, and everything that goes into that, um, definitely. Um, 
John, you still there? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. okay. Um, it, uh, at Corteva, um, you know, your, do you think that there's a general sentiment from the remote employees versus the in-office um, that uh, there's not as much opportunity for them, that uh, they're, they're looked as though they, they may not have the work ethic that those in the office have? It's an interesting question, and the fact of the matter is that at Corteva, uh, at least in the U.S., we, we really, uh, to my explain at the beginning, you know, aside from our uh, our frontline production workers and research workers who you know are just essential to be on site, uh, you know, all of us, uh, all the rest of us, really have not been, and our we do not intend to open the offices back up to a great extent now until September. So uh, we will be learning more about this, but you know, my. I think uh, it's it's always been important. It's just going to become that much more important going forward. You know, intentional career planning and you know periodic discussions with employees about their aspirations. Um, you know, while uh, while remote workers, yeah, the you know the the chance opportunities to bump into somebody or or interact with a senior leader might not be there. There's you know nothing keeping top talent from being proactive and uh, you know scheduling. Uh, virtual uh, coffee breaks or, or lunch breaks, or you know, when we do get the offices more opened up, coming in to uh, invest some time intentionally with a mentor or a leader, they're just going to put more onus on uh, on employees and people leaders to uh, uh, to develop those habits and, and be intentional in making those contacts. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, just to finish on this uh, this specific article, um, if we could move to the slide. Um, it's interesting that, that, that so she kind of finishes with a couple of studies um, in, in really looking at remote work, work, remote work teams versus in-office teams. And the first one is a Gartner study that really showed that um, the remote workers seem to be more agile, were able to adjust more quickly. Um, I, I think there's... Uh, I think they found correlation, but we don't really know what causation is at this point. But I think it's really something to think about. Why is that? Why would remote teams um, be able to pivot and change more quickly? And then another one um, from Gartner, um, I'm not sure if it's the same study or not, but it shows that remote teams or or people that are working remotely um, are more willing to take risks versus in an office. Um, You know, there could be some... Um, you know, pressures from from your peers that are right there and around you and, and more of a fear of a risk of failure, something there. But once again, there, we're just starting to see these correlations and what it is. And it, it's, it's, I don't have any questions around it. I just think it's something that we really want to dig into and think about um, as we, we continue to, to go through this. You know, I think time is a key factor. So yeah. the typical person, at least in our area, is probably commuting somewhere between an hour and a half and two hours a day. Then they get to the office. Well, we don't have, we're sort of out in the country, so if you're going to go to town for lunch, there goes another hour, hour and a quarter minimum to get lunch. If you work from home, you win back automatically three hours, mm-hmm. automatically. And those people just don't lay in bed in their pajamas. They're up and going to work. Mm-hmm. And so they're putting in more time, and they have time to be flexible, flexible and adjust. And to your point earlier, you know, we're running a global implementation of SAP right now. So it's an India team and a U.S. team and a South America team. And for us U.S. folks, we're starting at 6 a.m. Well, my expectation isn't that people are getting up at 4.30 and going in the office and sitting at their mm-hmm. desk at 6 a.m. They're doing that call from home. Mm-hmm. And it's saving them a tremendous amount of time, which in the end creates flexibility yeah. from my point of view. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so if we look at the last study that we wanted to go through, and uh, um, and I want to, um, we'll move through this, and we do have some. I want to make sure we have time for questions. So if anybody that has questions, please get them to Katie or submit them online. Um, so Grand Rapids uh, Business Journal, so my hometown, Grand Rapids. Give them a shout out. But uh, um, here's how small businesses can move past the long-term challenges of uh, COVID-19. So. I think the big question, and of course you know this is coming to you, Dan, it's uh, um, with a small remote work team, does it work? And just thinking about this and going through the article, um, productivity, do we see a change in productivity from the team perspective 
Is there a change in the synergistic effect when you have you know the, the team working together there? Um, you know, does it possibly um, work against the team and lose its edge? And I always think and I've worked for small companies before, and a, a, a lot of times it's the David versus Goliath mentality that okay, we're we're going against a big guy, but um, we're more agile, we can move, we can change, we can innovate faster than them, and that's how we're trying to win the game here, right? Um, and then you start to get into IT costs and HR costs and compliance and, and just the additional difficulties with that. So, um, you know, I, I know you, you mentioned hybrid before and everything, but just thinking about these factors specifically, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I guess from, from a productivity perspective, you know, one of, one of our best practices was making sure that with the technology tools that are available, and uh, whether it's Zoom or Teams, we happen to use Teams, mm. but uh, we spent a fair amount of time getting our people um, acclimated to how to use Teams, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you talk about earlier, somebody scheduling time with you to have a chat. Well, now you can see with a little button, right, whatever color the button is, mm -hmm. whether somebody's available, whether they're away, um, and whatnot. So. I think the, to keep the competitive, ed competitive edge, um, and not necessarily David versus Goliath, but David versus other Davids mm -hmm. out there, right, which yeah. uh, might be the case, yeah. is really uh, equipping the team and making sure that, uh, again, those, those pods, if you have hybrid work environments or totally remote uh, staff, that they have connectivity uh, back to uh, the, the organization. I, I think another thing I'd mention is just, that, and we, we talk a lot about you know, how, how the employees what, what they want. I think as, as employers, unless you have engagement with your people and a reason for them to stick with you beyond getting up in the morning and, and doing work from home or, or coming in the office, making sure that you're keeping the people engaged mm -hmm. and trying to have activities, whether it's virtual happy hours, whether it's um, what it, virtual coffee breaks, yeah. um, those sorts of things are, are vital because uh, people lack engagement and they're going to drift off and if anybody has a great time, easy time finding people in this environment, raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Right? Not, yeah. not the case. Finding right? good people, yeah. yeah. So, and it's especially important for, for smaller businesses because mm -hmm. losing one person in a 100-person company is a lot different than losing one person in a 1,000, 2,000 mm -hmm. employee company. So mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, it's crucial that there's engagement, that there's tools. And, and, and honestly, you know, what, what person working for any of our businesses wants to be non-productive? Mm -hmm. So I think helping them just realize their potential and, and having conversations, do you have what you need, mm -hmm. um, is, is a really good conversation. Do you think there's some barriers to entry that um, put a smaller company at a disadvantage being, you know, in regards to, I go back to IT, but, and I think we may have talked about this, yep. but just the, uh, the vulnerability that you have with your, um, your information in your company now with people working from home and in regards to being, you know, you have to protect yourself from being hacked and right. you know, all these other pieces there. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, Lacrosse Seed's part of a, a global business DLF, right? So mm -hmm. there's, I guess I, I would say we have a little bit of a uh, differentiation there because we do get like, here's a test phishing email that goes out and then you see how many people actually click on the, <laughs> the attachment and then they're busted. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but no, it, it, it's absolutely right because if you're starting to send files around back and forth, I mean, there, there's certainly a um, great opportunity for, for getting hacked. And again, to me, that goes back to just making sure that you're communicating mm -hmm. with your outside workers saying, watch out for this. And, you know, like we've had, I don't know how many times we've had somebody text me or call me, hey, did you need me to go get some gift cards, mm. right? $100 gift cards, mm -hmm. that's, that's a beautiful one. <laughs> so it, it's like, these are the scams that are out there, don't fall for them, and uh, if, so, when in doubt, uh, pick up the phone. So you're saying that Saudi prince doesn't want to share that money with you? I, <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> okay, um, so we can move it into questions. So anybody that has questions, please uh, um, get them over to, to, to Katie. Um, you know, Andrew, a question for you. Um, when we think about working remotely, and we've talked a lot about office type of work, um, but I, I'm sure in your, uh, over the last year, you've had to um, meet with customers more remotely and, um, and, and work with them on a different basis. Um, what are your thoughts there in regards to how well that works, and is it something that's going to change your work habits down the road? Absolutely. One of the first things I think about is the acceleration of adoption to technology by the farmer. 
Uh, in general, the farmer is average of 60 years old, mm-hmm. and many of them had uh, never dialed into a conference call or never attended a Zoom call. And we have been able to successfully deploy um, a number of informational uh, agronomy calls, timely information to distribute out into the field. And that has been an element where we've won during the pandemic as as an agricultural society to be able to provide timely information when the growers need it um, through through those means. Um, so I absolutely do think, you know, there has been, been areas there, but it has been a challenge. Um, for example, uh, if you think about any of our businesses, I mean, we have to sell something to keep the R&D, you know, engine going. And there were situations where uh, cold calling, prospecting, you just didn't know, you know, where someone was on the scale of being comfortable. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll never forget sitting in a machine shed with a farmer, and um, he had two. Ch- I scheduled in advance was critical, mm-hmm. but um, sat. He had two chairs positioned in the shop, and I was on one side, and he was on the other. Yeah. And I had brought my iPad to share some information with him, mm-hmm. and I realized, you know. I'm not going to hand him this because mm-hmm. I've been touching it. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to have to change the way I present information. And I think one of the pieces um, that we've also been able to determine is, is important going forward to is respect of time. So the idea of um, I'm going to spend the whole day just randomly, you know, pulling down farm lanes. How about working to get contact information and ask them when it's okay to come for a time and visit with them about you know a business matter um so there's a lot that we've learned but i think that uh, we can gain a lot from this time too do you think you'd um, 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 intentionally work more remotely with your customers or do you think you're sacrificing um, something in doing that i think understanding the customer is is very important you know um, I work with a a team of sellers and one of them started in 1997 and he said when I started Mm -hmm. almost all my customers wanted to go out in the field with me they Mm -hmm. wanted to see what the product was doing Mm -hmm. we could talk about it together he said in in today's business um, with the amount they have to manage etc only a segment of my customers maybe a Mm -hmm. third want to walk with me Mm -hmm. instead they want to see my digital report emailed to them on what I saw when I was out there and what I need to do with it. The next, okay, I need to apply fungicide to that Mm -hmm. corn based on disease pressure. So um, I think we've got to be able to better segment our customers and Mm -hmm. understand out of this how they prefer to communicate Mm -hmm. um, because that's uh, an element of future success is is having that understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, so I manage a team of um, sales reps and product development reps. Um, and it's uh, specifically for large seed uh, processing crops, so sweet corn and green beans. And we direct sell to processors for the most part. And same thing, uh, the team was struggling, like, you know, I want to take my customers through the trials. You know, how do we do that? And, you know, we, you know, we're trying to move product forward, trying to launch it. So what we ended up doing was if we can't bring them to the trial, let's bring the trial to them. So we'd have a report for them, but we had some coolers made up with our logo on them. And uh, we sent them the product and said, here it is. You know, if, it, if they freeze, they freeze it. If we can, maybe we'll show them some canned samples, stuff like that, and, uh, and really trying to bring it. Uh, like I said, I had a new, a new sales rep in Canada trying to meet her new customers and trying to really, um, you know, develop a relationship with them, you know, that first impression. But she couldn't, like, physically be there in front of them. She's like, what do I do? Um, and when we, we, were, we came up with some ideas, I said, you know, send them a gift card for the, the local restaurant because we're all trying to help out the restaurants right now, you know, stuff like that. And, and it, it wasn't easy. I mean, she just really had to struggle through it um, because, you know, some of these things are hard. And I kind of pushed on the question because I think, um, I really think, with, especially with my sales team, that there's a, there's a strong value to being there in person. Mm-hmm. And um, quite honestly, and, and it really goes back to the conversation we were having before. When you look at the customer's perspective, um, the, the sales reps that are there day in, day out, the sales reps that they physically see and are around, I think there's a higher likelihood of getting the sale because there's a higher trust level mm-hmm. 
You know, they know the person. You know, I know Bill. He lives down here. He's got two kids or whatever it is. Um, and uh, I, I think there's a, definitely a value there. Um, so, John, um, thinking about Corteva. And, and I'm just kind of thinking about things from a little bit different perspective here. And, and, uh, and, and, and everybody feel free to chime in on this. But do we think this will change the, the employee marketplace, so to speak? Because if, you know, um, Jane Doe here works out of the office and now wants to work remotely and, you know, move to Denver, Colorado, because Jane loves to ski, and then just work remotely. But if everybody's working remotely, does that change the pool of people that can do this job and how much it costs to employ them? Oh, saving the easy questions for the end, AJ. Eh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's, it is, uh, it is the, the proverbial mil, million dollar one. I, I really appreciated what Mike shared in terms of the model that his team has used and how they're thinking about you know, the key dynamics of the job and the person in the technology, it's 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 also critical. We're already seeing it, you know, at, at Corteva, as I'm sure others are too. Uh, you know, some more tenured, proven professionals who said, "Hey, I I would really appreciate. If I'm going to be able to work remote. I'd appreciate the chance to do this job you know, two states away to be able to be closer to an aging parent or uh, support my spouse's career aspirations." And you know, we're we're dipping our toe in that water and, and enabling that. The different end of the spectrum, brand new talent, folks just coming out of college, uh, that importance of uh, you know, getting them into your, your culture and getting them onboarded successfully. Some, some time in the office with, uh, with, with tenured uh, colleagues, it, is, it runs the gambit. So, again, I, I think we're all going to be on a pretty steep learning curve for some time to come. Uh, this is certainly a space where one size does not fit all. Uh, I know that makes it more challenging to manage. Um, but I think, you know, as employers, as an industry, we're going to have to wrap our head around that because uh, it, is, it is dynamic and it is differential, in my opinion. Okay, very good. Uh, Mike, um, so have you seen any correlation in, uh, at, at Rice Tech in those that want to work remotely and, um, well, I guess any generational correlation? Do you think that uh, um, it's definitely the younger crowd? or, or in No. No, I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think it's situational. So yeah. if uh, some people that, even young people that don't feel like they have a adequate workspace at their home, they've come to the office mm. because they just don't have a workspace in their home to do their job effectively. They, yeah. you know, whether it's the kids or the dog or the just, you know, the whole fam and they just don't have a space. Uh, so I think it's very situational. On the other hand, there are some people that really need to stay at home because of child care or a senior person in the house that they need to take care of, and they need that flexibility to oversee that situation. So I wouldn't put it generational. I would put it situational. Very good. And do you see um, a uh, – would you say you're, you're, you think you're in the middle of a culture shift that's being forced because of this? I think it's less of a shift that's being forced, but more of a realization. Mm. So there are certainly some roles that can be completely effective in a remote uh, work situation. I'll give you an example. My CFO lives in Germany. Mm. I, and it's been that way from the beginning since I've been there. And this guy is driven and he's fully effective. Mm. And he makes the time, pre-COVID, of course, but he makes the time to be on the site, in the businesses, when it's important for him to be there. But, you know, he lives where he lives because that's where he lives. And there's no reason, in my view, to change that. So that model in certain roles can certainly be extended. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Okay. If we want to look at one more stat here that I just wanted to finish with. Um, so this goes back to that McKenzie study. And um, I, I found this to be quite interesting that, you know, if we remember what they talked about in regards to, um, you know, one of the big issues that they see is just a higher level of anxiety and in this transition. Um, but one thing that they found for sure was that the companies that, that really um, communicated a very clear plan uh, to the people 
reduce those anxieties. And McKenzie says that that will result in, in directly in higher, higher uh, uh, more productive employees. Okay, and um, the companies that did not, or that was it was it was it was a bit foggy, and they really didn't have a clear, or they just weren't sure what they were going to do because it's all new, and they're trying to figure it out. But they weren't as clear in showing that and showing the work that's going through. Um, that created a much higher level of anxiety within employees. So I think the one big thing that um, to take out of uh, out of that study is. You know, this is new for all of us, and, and we're in the middle of a change here of some sort. Um, but once again, communication is, is one of the paramount things that companies need to be focused on to be able to um, um, really keep their employees engaged and productive. So, um, and we already did questions and answers. So, um, I want to thank our panel. Please, everybody. At, uh, <laughs> I, I think it's a really, really interesting conversation, and it's, and it's we're just at the tip of it right now, and we're going to continue to be talking and evolving here. So, um, our next session shifts to more of the policy side of our conference with a discussion on health testing and our phytosanitary session. So, stay tuned. But first, here's a quick update on the UN Food Systems Summit. Thank you. friends in the seed industry, Ted McKinney here, still doing my public service, but this time I'm working with a coalition that ASTA belongs to. It's a coalition of many, many people like you, industry, corporate, others, as we work to engage the Food Systems Summits. The first one, a pre-summit in Rome in late July, the big one, the final one, in New York City in late September. So you may wonder, what in the world is a Food Systems Summit? Well, basically it's this. The United Nations Secretary General and many others recognize that for many reasons, the latest being COVID, we are not likely to reach the sustainable development goals set years ago, and the deadline's 2030. So what do we do when we're not going to meet a goal? We take a step back, we reassess, we make adjustments, we try to make the goal. That's what's going on. In this case, it's very important. Why? First, the world has to come together, all of us to address global food and climate uh, challenges. No doubt about that. The second though is also very important. To do that, sometimes you adjust policy and not all the world sees and does food and ag production like we. And that's why we've got to get it right because it involves policy. So this is why we're engaged. And once again, you should be proud that ASTA is among the leaders. There are four key goals that we're doing, and the focus on this is we in the U.S. are very proud of the efficiency, the technology, the innovation that delivers the safest, least cost, and I would dare say highest quality products in the world. We can't give that up. It'd be crazy. So there's four goals that we have. First, focus on ensuring all foods optimize the environment and ensure diet quality impacts. You got to get the nutrition right, and you got to get the environment right. The second one, you ought to recognize quickly, <clears throat> support food systems that are inclusive of science and technology and innovation. We cannot give that up, and not enough of that's being voiced around the world. The third is you've got to be flexible. Changes in weather, changes in conditions, changes in technologies. We all, the world, has to be adaptive. And finally, we have to reflect international consensus respect domestic and international obligations, commitments, the law, basic, and we've got to be honest with ourselves and follow the regulations that set forth our country by country basis. These are the four things. So I hope that you will be at least supportive of ASTA and the International Seed Federation and everybody else who's working on this. You can do that by doing right by the environment, making your input known and supporting the association. And remember, you all are particularly important because, first, it's the seed. Thanks so much. Appreciate your support. Bye-bye.